Amen. Amen. As you take your seats, why don't you turn to someone and say, Good morning. Good to see you. We are, we are in for a great uh, message this morning. We're doing things a little bit different. We're going to have the message. Uh, so why don't we just welcome Pastor Helen. And why don't we really make a welcome as she comes. Good morning, everybody, and a very happy, happy New Year to you all. Amen. This is the first day of the rest of your life. Amen. And what a better place to, to enjoy it together as believers in God. I'm going to speak this morning on one of the most wonderful areas of confession in the scriptures by our Saviour. Amen. I was amazed when I looked up this uh, scripture, how many other scriptures were there. And the message of the heading of my message this morning is, the kingdom of God is within you. The kingdom of God is within you. These are the words of Christ. Oh, sorry. sorry, brother. The kingdom of God is within you. These are the words of Christ, our Saviour. And this is what it says in Luke 17, 20 to 21. The kingdom of God does not come with careful observation. Nor will people say, here it is, or there it is. Because the kingdom of God is within you. Jesus mentions many times the revelation of the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. He exhorts us to seek it, to be near it, to be nigh on it, and refers to little children as being a description of the kingdom of God. Amen. Because this was the message. One day Jesus closed the door of the carpenter's shop and said, I'm going to go out and preach the message of the kingdom. And a lot of us don't understand what actually the kingdom of God is. But I want you to know this, and I'm sure you do, that Jesus is the centre of it all. He's the head of the kingdom of God. And we want to have Jesus as the centre of it all in our lives, don't we? That is our desire. And how can we attain this? Well, the answer is in the Lord's teaching of the kingdom of God. His kingdom dwelling in you and dwelling in me is the centre of it all. Romans 14 says this, the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, or what you put on, or where you go, or what sort of a car you drive, or what sort of a job you have, but the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. And this is what God wants to dwell in us with, his righteousness, his peace, his joy. Amen. And that is the righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. It's the Holy Ghost that sets up his kingdom within us. I'm filled, filled, filled with the Holy Ghost. I used to sing that old chorus. One time I remember my son Bruce said, Mum, we sang that chorus 33 times <laughs> the night in church. It's the Holy Ghost. It's the Holy Ghost. When anyone asks, what's the matter with you? Just say, I'm filled, filled, thrilled with the Holy Ghost. As we allow the Holy Spirit to have full reign in our lives, the kingdom of God comes to us. The kingdom of God comes to us. And I want to encourage you this morning with three little words. 
three vital words that Jesus taught his disciples when they asked him to teach them how to pray. He said, Our Father, which art in heaven, Amen. Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. To me. Let's be selfish about it this morning. Let's be selfish. Thy kingdom come to me. I'm willing to pay the price because there is a price to pay. But you know, to many people, the word kingdom can have offensive con 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 connotations because democracy is our word. Oh yes, I've decided to do this, that and something else. The right to govern ourselves is democracy. Kingdom means the king rules. Now we know there's been many evil tyrants and dictators. But they were wicked men. And they went in the absolute opposite way of what the kingdom of heaven is or what the kingdom of God is. And they wreaked death and destruction and somehow it settles within us when somebody says, like oh, God challenges us to give up our lives to him. We must confess that he is saviour and Lord. Every knee shall bow and every tongue to confess. Amen. And we need to have that experience in our lives. Because the kingdom means absolute power is granted to the one who rules over us. It conscripts the resources of a country and people to the governing body of the time. In fact, some of us assert the right of self-rule, even to the point of dethroning God in our lives. But you know, in one sense, God's kingdom has already come, whether we acknowledge it or not. The laws of the kingdom govern the creation and the universe with absolute authority. They say, if the world would tilted even one more degree, degree in a certain direction, tragedy, devastation, would happen. God has placed everything under the rule of his kingdom. Amen? So we don't have to worry about what's coming ahead. We don't have to worry about floods, droughts. We are concerned to help people who go through these things. But God's rule works good. For, not only for us, but for creation. We're the ones that break all the rules, aren't we? And you know, God's kingdom is so vital to peace in our time. And we see laws in the scientific world. And the scientist recognises the kingdom through the microscope and the telescope. He sees it in the precision of the cosmos. The physician will tell you there are health laws. To disobey brings sickness and death. I remember when my husband was in, in the army, they used to have sick call every morning. And the soldiers would line up and one man would come glowing like a red tomato. He'd laid out in the sun all day and he got terribly sunburned and he was blistering and he was in agony and he stood there and they, they, they uh, put ointment on him but he was put on a charge. He did it to himself. He broke the law of health. Or somebody went out and went on a binge and came rolling in the next day and got on sick call because he was vomiting all night because of his over going in the wine department or the whiskey department or whatever it might be, and he was put on a charge. 
it broke the rules of the army and there was a penalty to pay. And the psychiatrist, he recognised that a man's pattern of thinking must be along the right lines. To turn off the track, to be, it means to become unbalanced. The sociologist knows that the good of one is the good of all. We are bound together by a common brotherhood, which is one of the laws of the, of the, of the kingdom. All governments, even our Australian government, have laws. And we have a choice, obey or disobey. Obey or disobey, and then suffer the consequence of any wrong decision we may make. All right, I know that I've broken the law by speeding. I must admit that I've only been charged once. But it doesn't mean to say I haven't got away with it another time. But if I get caught, I have to pay 400, 500, 600, losing a license, whatever it might be. Or if we go into Woolies and stuff things down our shirts and run out without paying, we suffer the consequence. Thank you. <laughs> we go to Canberra. We see the seat of government and all the rubbish that goes on out up there. And they bring down bills to change the laws. Because they can. They can change the laws. They can be repealed. And we have seen governments fall because of these reasons, but not so with the laws of God. Genesis declares, God spoke and it was so. He's an unchanging God. I could rebel against God's law of gravitation by jumping out of a window of a high building that I would kill myself. So I used the elevator. Is that negating God's law to ingenuity? No. Suppose the elevator cable breaks or the power fall fails or because, and because of that, the Otis Company recognises the law of gravity and they respect it by regularly maintaining every lift every elevator in high-rise buildings, including mine. The whole world is God's kingdom. It is under his sovereign rule and power. Kingdom, rule, power and authority. God is over all, even to the smallest details. I was amazed last year. I got a love for beautiful smelling lilies. And every week I'd go to Aldi, I'd buy a bunch of lilies and bring them home. And what amazed me, we might get a small lily or a large lily, but the number of stains never altered. Thirteen little stains in every lily, whether large or small. God's way was perfect. Is perfect. Amen. Amen. The failure in a man or woman's life today is not that they didn't get the breaks in life. Because they were there. They were available. The reason is that they missed the revelation of kingdom rule. A rule and authority that Jesus said should abide in all of us. Abide. Rest. Relax. And we receive it from him personally. You know, Jesus said, or the scripture tells us, that through Christ we are lifted up to dwell 
in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. How do we do that? By living in the kingdom of God. Two, nearly 250 times in the Bible, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, God's kingdom, my kingdom, are mentioned nearly 250 times. And Jesus knew it was an important message to bring because the first message he ever preached was the kingdom of God is known. And one day Jesus closed the door of the carpenter shop Carpenter's shop to go about proclaiming the kingdom of God, his father's business. Amen. The text of his very first message was the kingdom of God is at hand. There has to be a spiritual rebirth and it has to be a continuum now. You know, you just don't come out the front, give your life to Christ and then go and live as you like. You've got to say, what are the rules? of this kingdom of living. What is the way that we should live? It's a spiritual rebirth. First of all, you must be born again. Secondly, you follow Jesus and obey him. Jesus said to his disciples, do you love me? He said, oh yes, Lord. He said, then obey me. That's where we have the problem, isn't it? In our lives. Amen. Thy kingdom come to me. David Livingston, a man used to use mightily by God, who went into the unknown and savage country of his time, Africa, preaching the kingdom. He recognised the vital importance of the kingdom being preached, but in him first. On the last day of his earthly life, he wrote these words, my Jesus, my life, my King, I again dedicate my life and your kingdom to you. You see, it's easier for us to say, Thy kingdom go. Thy kingdom go. Thy kingdom go. Go to this one, go to that one, go to my cranky neighbour, go to my boss, go to my husband, go to my wife. But I'm saying this morning the kingdom has to come to you. You've got to realise that God wants to live in you in all his fullness. And I can tell you it's easy to do. It's not hard. It's just the willingness in our lives to hand over our, our attitudes to Jesus, who's king of our kingdom. You see, thy kingdom come to me means that I am prepared to change. How many of you this morning are prepared to change? Right. Lord, you're going to be challenged by this message and I hope that you say yes, Lord. Amen. You look into your own hearts first and ask for his cleansing and forgiveness to abdicate from self-rule and put Jesus on the throne of our lives as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I, then I will bow before him in faith, love and obedience. Jesus said to his disciples, do you love me? Then obey him. Do you love him this morning? Then obey him. Then obey him. I read a true story of a dog who died in a fire guarding his master's lunch. The broken hearted owner said, I always had to be careful of what I told him to do because I knew he would do it. There was a man that Jesus spoke about in the parables that it saw a pearl and he searched all his life for it. And he knew that he wanted to have it, so he sold all that he had for this one pearl. Can you this morning sell all that you have? The pearl. Great price. Christ. 
Amen. All right. So to really pray, Thy kingdom come means I am willing to surrender everything I possess in order to possess God. I submit I recognise his absolute authority. Jesus said this strange thing. He said, whosoever loses control for my sake shall find it. Whosoever saves his life shall lose it. You see, Jesus has not promised us life. He's promised us abundant life. More than abundant life. God wants to move in our hearts. Amen. And it's so easy for me to say, and I do say it, where God kingdom is needed. Well, I wrote a few down. Corruption in government. Evils of drugs and liquor. Pornographic films and literature. Sexual promiscuity. Abuse of children. Terrorism. Violence. Murder. Godless nations. But before I pray where it is needed in our hearts, firstly it come to me. Jonathan Edwards, a great preacher, so prayed this way. He said, I go out to preach with two aims in mind. First, everyone who hears the message or to give their lives to Christ. But whether or not anyone else gives Jesus his life, I will give him mine. The spiritual laws of the kingdom are found in Ephesians 4, 31, verse 2, 1 and 2. Sorry, say that again. Ephesians 4, 3, 1 and 2. Here's the people who dwell in his kingdom. Let all bitterness and indignation and wrath, passion, rage, bad temper, quarrelling, animosity and blasphemous language be banished from you. Drop it. Take a different path. You know, repent means to go a different way. To turn and go a different way. Repent this morning. If you've been doing all those things, you've been bitter and angry and swearing and doing all these things, he says, he vanished from you. And become useful to one another. And you like that. I need you to be useful to me and I need to be useful to you. We need one another. We're part of a family. We're part of a family and Jesus, God is our father and Jesus is a bro our brother and the Holy Spirit dwells in each one of us, spiritual lords of the kingdom. Amen. And become useful to one another, tender-hearted, compassionate, helpful and kind. Brothers and sisters this morning, I'm talking about the younger ones. Isn't it hard to be compassionate to your brother or sister when they're teasing the life out of you? Well, in God's kingdom, you can do it. You can do it. Helpful and kind. Forgiving one another readily and freely. As God in Christ Jesus forgave you. I love that scripture. Christ in me. The hope of heaven. Kingdom of heaven. Christ is dwelling in us and we are his people. His kingdom in me. The kingdom of heaven is not meat and drink, but righteousness, peace and joy. Amen. 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 Thank you, Mum. That's great. Amen. Who wants to grow up to be like Grandma Helen yes. at the age of 90, <laughs> preaching the truth about God's kingdom? And not just preaching it, but living it by, our, by example. Um, it's great, isn't it, to have a church 
filled with beautiful, wise, older people. And um, we're going to come around the table of the Lord. And as we just reflect on the message, because it's got to start in here first. It's got to start in our own hearts. So the emblems are going to come around, but maybe just reflect that we forgive others because Christ has forgiven us. Amen. Who loves Jesus this morning? just pray, Lord, and I know as we've talked about it, Lord, you take the lead and I'll follow. Thank you. Over to you, Holy Spirit. As we start a new year, let's remember Jesus who showed us and gave us an example on forgiveness. He was so cruelly treated, completely free from sin, and his response while dying, while dying, was, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. Ephesians 4, verse 32. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgives you. The word tender-hearted just spoke to me and I thought, Lord, is my heart tender? Sometimes it gets wounded, sometimes it tries to protect itself and get hard. But I don't want a hard heart, Lord God. I want a heart that is tender and soft to you, tender and soft to the Holy Spirit, and tender and soft to my brothers and sisters here at Voyage, and tender and hearted to a world out there that needs you so much. So may I just stop and pray. We just pray that the Holy Spirit would massage our heart, that he would massage, just imagine him massaging our heart and making them very tender and soft so that we, so that we can glorify you, massage our heart, Holy Spirit, make it soft, make it beautiful, make it so that we, Father, can reach out to those in need so we can glorify you our bodies can glorify you change our heart lord give us a tender heart in jesus name one quote from graham cook he's allowed me to say it we don't have a right to stay offended 
but we have a right to be healed. Why? Because of the cross. Isaiah 53 verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed. I will pray now and then we can eat and drink together. Dear Heavenly Father, we humbly come to you and we pray as you taught us, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. As you told us to do, remember you as we eat the bread and drink from the cup as a symbol of your blood and body given for us. Father, your blood is like acid to our sin and we have been set free from all bondages and we are no longer a slave to any negative in our life from Satan, but we are children of God no longer a sinner, but becoming saints. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. All glory and power and praise we give to Jesus alone. Amen. Let's eat and drink together.